welcome to the Living Out podcast, helping people, churches and society talk about faith and sexuality. Hello and welcome to the Living Out podcast, your go-to resource for discussions about faith and sexuality from the perspective of Christians who are ourselves same-sex attracted or gay. My name's Andrew Bunn, I'm going to be your host today, and I'm really thrilled to be joined by my friends Anne Whitting and Andy Robertson. Hi guys, how are you doing? Doing well, thanks. All right, thanks. How are you? I am good, thank you. And I'm very excited to have Andy with us. Andy, it's your very first time on the podcast. Welcome. Uh, Why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so my name is uh, Andy. I'm about two months into working with Living Out. Um, The rest of my time, I'm a pastor of a church in Oxford. And I'm a pastor because, well, I come from the north, so I'm a pastor rather than a pastor. <laughs> I just feel hungry every time you say that. I love pasta. It's literally my favourite <laughs> food. My lunch almost every day is pasta. And every time you say it, I'm like, oh, pasta. Yeah, um, I, 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 to be honest, <laughs> I, I probably do say those words exactly the same. Sort of spaghetti is pasta and my job is being a pastor. So uh, I'm sorry to confuse you, Andrew, or make you feel I hungry. I like it. No, no, I like it. I, I'm never sad thinking about pasta. Uh, so you've been with us a couple of months. What's been the best thing about joining the team at Living Out? Well, I, it's funny. One of the things I guess you've picked up in in the podcast in the first series is the importance of friendship. And it actually, this does feel like a kind of group of friends who were all same sex attracted, were friends together. We want to help people. And so far, it's felt quite friendly. I, I don't know whether I'll discover some sort of hidden darkness soon, but so far, it feels like quite a friendly team. Yeah, we just go easy in your first couple of months, but you yeah. know, okay. it's hard after that. Mm, okay, I'll I'll wait to see how it turns out. <laughs> Two months, there's plenty of time to go. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Well, in this series of Living Out Podcast, we are exploring eight questions that we get asked most often. And we like to call them our explore questions because they're great ways of exploring faith and sexuality. And you'll find them front and centre on our website, on the homepage at livingout.org. And today we've reached a really important question that takes us beyond some of the theory of a Christian understanding of sexuality to the actual reality of living it out. Today we're going to ask the question, Christian and same-sex attracted, is it doable? Is it actually possible to thrive and flourish as a Christian who is same-sex attracted and who's committed to the Christian sexual ethic? Anne and Andy, you're both Christians. You're both same-sex attracted. So tell us about your experience of this. Is it doable? I mean, it is so far. So one of my mid-40s, I guess, I've been sort of a Christian and same-sex attracted for, uh, let's say, 30 years now. Um, And I'm still going. Um, Yeah, I mean, it's hard at times, so there are elements of challenge in it. I guess largely it's some of the the challenges that would apply to anybody who's single. So there are degrees of loneliness. Um, There are times when perhaps other aspects of life are are difficult and you think, it'd be great to have a spouse to talk this through with. Uh, So there are pains in in that way, but I guess it's sort of common to to all those who are, are single. And then I guess there are challenges like, you know, friendships can sometimes feel a bit confusing. So, yeah, it's hard, but also there are opportunities to flourish in the midst of it. Mm. I think that thing I've been really helped as my own walk, realising a lot of what we experience is just the common thing of being adult single. Uh, Mm. Because that really helps actually, you know, you might be that there are very few of you in your church who are same-sex attracted, but there will be other people who are adults and who are single. And probably some people who are a bit older than you have been following Jesus as a single person for longer and stuff. And I think just learning from the wisdom of other people who really are having a parallel experience, even though there's some differences, has been really, really helpful for me. So you mentioned a few of the difficulties there, Andy. What are some of the things that have helped you to, um, to, uh, to walk through those and to, uh, to thrive in the midst of those? I suppose a couple of things, really. So I've mentioned it already. Friendships make a huge difference. So I think one of the issues we sometimes get wrong is we think life is either kind of marriage or misery. And I think that's just not the case, that you can have deep and meaningful friendships that are emotionally satisfying. But but bizarrely, actually, one of the things that's helped me is just to realise that doing something hard because you believe in Jesus 
it, that's kind of normal. Actually, that's what it is to be a, a Christian disciple. Um, so uh, there are times when I just think, gosh, this is hard, but hang on, Jesus told me being a disciple involved carrying a cross. Well, hey, this is just part of the deal. And and sometimes it has just been saying to myself, Andy, don't drift into self-pity. This is part of the deal. This is the pathway to find true life. And that's helped me quite a lot, actually. Do you think there are um, ways in which being a same-sex attracted Christian is harder than being a opposite sex attracted Christian? I mean, there are probably certain elements that are, are more difficult, aren't there? So I guess friendships can sometimes feel a bit more confusing. So, you know, you're finding a friendship emotionally satisfying and then sometimes the question will go off in your head, is this too emotionally satisfying? Mm. I, th- I think that's one of the issues that I guess a same-sex attracted Christian will find that an opposite sex attracted Christian doesn't find. I think that I think my experience was probably as a teenager and in my twenties. I think to be a same-sex attracted Christian was probably harder because you're wrestling with all of those questions. Mm. I think now, to be honest, I actually because I think in my case I'm now sort of accepting I probably won't get married to somebody of the opposite sex. I think sometimes my position is easier actually than friends of mine who are still wondering, should I get married? Will I get married? Will I not get married? I I think you come to a place of acceptance. And I I think it does get easier as you get older in certain ways. I don't know. Andrew obviously doesn't know about that yet. But um, (laughs) um, but, (laughs) uh, so I'm tempted to say, Anne, what do you think about that? But that's just rude, isn't it? Yeah. It's all right, because every week we have some sort of dig at my age, so that's fine. <laughs> and how young I apparently am, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's a lot in that, Andy. Yeah, I think um, my Christian walk and my sort of wrestling with same-sex attraction has definitely got easier as I've got older. I think um, my experience, well, <laughs> I, I suppose I was same-sex attracted for quite a while before I was a Christian. And so that was, for me, I think identity has been a big deal. So um, because, you know, I knew I was gay when I was in like single digits and became a Christian at 19 and then had to work out how those two things slotted together or didn't slot together. And I was pretty convinced about the biblical sexual ethic, but it was the living it out that was the problem. And uh, so this question of, is it doable, was probably the the biggest thing that I was wrestling with in, in my early 20s. And to be honest, I, you know, I, I made a bit of a mess of things because I think... My approach was, I think I know what the right thing to do is. I should I should be single. I should not get into these relationships. But I just f- found it too hard to live like that. Um, and so inevitably kept messing up. And I went in this cycle of, you know, having relationships, then feeling guilty and then repenting and then doing it again. And um, sort of got to the point where I felt like something has to change. This isn't sustainable. I think I either at this point ditch Christianity or something you know god's got to do something to change this um and i kind of it's it's bizarre but i kind of think of the analogy of flying and um you know you you can't fly just by sort of jumping and increasing height off the ground you know you are inevitably always going to get brought back to the ground by gravity you know what i needed was to hop in a plane you know i just i couldn't um, I couldn't get there by myself. Um, so this was a, yeah, my sort of turning point was realizing actually kind of what you were saying, Andy, to a large extent, it, it isn't doable by myself. You know, this is a Holy Spirit thing. I have to, um, I have to allow God to do it in me. And that was a massive turning point for me, letting God take over my sexuality, um, and actually being willing to trust that he wanted to give me good things, but I had to let go of my impoverished way of doing relationships. So, yeah, that was a sort of my 20s. I, I don't think I'd want to revisit that particular era. <laughs> but, you know, it's it's two decades ago now and definitely, definitely in a different place. So what helped you when you were in that kind of context and situation? Yeah, I think uh, one of the big things was finding other people, actually, because for a long time, I just felt like I was the only one trying to do this. Um, and I came across an organisation called True Freedom Trust, um, who are great friends of living out. Um, and I met other people who you know believed what the Bible said on sexuality. I made some absolutely wonderful friends. And I met people who were further along 
in their journey of discipleship than I was and who could model to me what it looks like to be faithful with your sexuality. Um, and it was like having teammates, you know, people to sort of encourage me not to give up. Um, and the surprise was that I've ended up with kind of better, deeper intimacy with other women um, than I had before. I've got women in my life that I really love and I can tell them I love them. And, you know, it's it, it's all good and it's God glorifying um and I kind of wish I'd known this 20 years ago. You know, I wish I trusted God sooner and let him intervene sooner. I can really relate to what you said, Anne, about the kind of the importance of pushing in, allowing God to do his work, persevering. And as you do that, it becomes possible and doable. I think for me, for me, my main crisis point about my faith in saturated was my, uh, was my first year university or something. When, as I look back now, I actually realised a load of other stuff going on in life that I was miserable about. It was a bad place. But it became the issue my sexuality became the kind of clincher thing and I just didn't know if I could do it and I got this funny position I love this story it's totally true though <laughs> I was generally I was considering two paths and I was very open my friends base at the time I was considering on the one hand just basically giving up on the idea of trying to follow Jesus faithfully and going to kind of local gay youth clubs and stuff trying to meet a guy or becoming a monk because actually I did know that what was oh, <laughs> and and face was a picture you know I seriously I found a modest child interested in all this kind of stuff because I knew that I wanted to be loved and I wanted to be in community. And that I did know that was actually what was kind of going on in my heart. And then two things helped me kind of, in a sense, come back to the middle road of following Jesus faithfully outside of a monastery. Um, one was just a friend kind of challenging me. Do you really think you've given God enough of a chance to help you before you give up? Which kind of gave me that thing of, yeah, I need to take some more steps. I need to play my part a bit more. I need to persevere and see what God does. And, and wonderfully, as he does, because he's faithful, God really helped me there. But also, I think, as I reflected on, these are my two things that seem appealing, a, a boyfriend or becoming a monk. Why is that? Realising, actually, what I want is to be loved. And then just God helped me to process, actually, that's totally available to me. And I got a bit hung up on, actually, how can I be loved when I'm not having sex? And I've not got a boyfriend, not got a husband. Mm -hmm. But actually, when I kind of had this realisation that got revealing to me, and actually, I can experience genuine, life-giving, loving relationships in the context of church family, suddenly it became plausible. It did become doable. And that was partly through close friends who kind of knew what I was going through and just deliberately invited me into their families and loved me and you know, fed me, took me on holiday, took me to drive, all these kind of things. And I realised, actually, I think this thing is going to be doable and going to be possible. I mean, I, th I think linked to that as well, it's, it, it, is just, it is just more doable when you're excited about Jesus, actually. I mean, I, I guess for all of us who are, are Christians, there are times where, you know, the truths about Jesus, we kind of believe them, but they're kind of at the back of our minds and they're a bit dry. And then other times you just just realize afresh how good he is how astonishing it is that he loves us the you know, the wonder of his death for us uh, when i'm thrilled by jesus this is so much more doable when jesus is at the back of my mind you kind of think why am i bothering and so just how do you keep a heart that really is satisfied in jesus amazed at his love for us i i i think yeah enjoying jesus is just key to to this being doable, which apparently is possible even if you're not a monk, but, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> who knew? That's such a good point, isn't it? Because I think that there are so many things actually about the Christian life that aren't doable if we disconnect from Jesus. Like, you know, forgiving someone who's really hurt us, is that doable? Well, not really, unless we let Jesus do it in us. Um, so I think that's that's huge. Yeah, we have to we have to let Jesus do the transformation in us. And I wonder if it links to what I, I experienced as one of the blessings of being a same sex attracted. And we were saying earlier what are the differences between being a single adult who's opposite sex attracted and a single adult who's same sex attracted. Even in my few years on this earth, at my young age, I have reached a point where I do see some of those blessings and differences. And one of them is because, like you, Andy, I kind of actually know from an early stage, I thought, I don't think opposite sex marriage is something I'm interested in. Therefore, I think faithful following Jesus means I'm single and celibate. And because that's kind of, I know that's now what life is, and I'm not wondering maybe when I won't find someone, it's just allowing me to throw myself into singleness with the benefits and blessings it brings. Mm -hmm. And particularly that amazing little phrase in 1 Corinthians 7 about the privilege of the opportunity singles have for undivided devotion to the Lord and just kind of living with the sense of I've got that opportunity that I want to make the most of. And I'm not always the best at making the most of it, but I think actually, you know, what a wonderful thing. And 
in a yeah, around, in a kind of funny way, a blessing of knowing from pretty early age. I'm almost certainly going to stay singing this better instead of it the rest of my life. Mm. Has helped me to push into, which means I get to do this undivided devotion thing. How excited that! That makes me yeah, not just think this is just about doable, but as you will say, it makes me excited about the prospect of of living it out. No, I I think that's absolutely right. I for me, singleness makes sense when I use it for undivided devotion to the Lord. Singleness doesn't make sense when I'm sort of all over the place. And so part of it is just the clarity of saying this is doable if my focus is that undivided devotion to the Lord. And, you know, when I'm living that out, yeah, it's absolutely worth it. Mm. And it's good to talk about... um some of the benefits isn't it because i think sometimes we do talk about you know is it durable is it you know the, even the language that we use is you know this is this is a really sort of hard and horrible thing and it is sometimes hard but there are really good things about being same sex attracted um and we've touched on on that a bit here and i mean for me i i, I wonder what my relationship with Jesus would look like if I wasn't same-sex attracted. I think I'd probably be much more career-focused and relationship-focused and, you know, materialistic. And I think it's forced me in some ways to take Jesus seriously um, in a way that I probably wouldn't have done otherwise. Um, That's just a way of sort of sneakily putting in a little trailer for an article that I wrote on the website about, um, uh, oh, what was it called? (laughs) Uh, What's good about struggling with same-sex attraction? And I think... Yeah, it, it is. It is sometimes can be seen as a weird sort of gift, really, um, as as a way of being more intimate with Jesus, and that's a massive blessing. I agree. I think my experience of sense attraction has deepened my faith, not hampered my faith on the whole, because actually, especially like being a teenager wrestling with stuff, actually kind of just caused me to throw myself on God, caused me to throw myself into the Word of God, see what He actually say, caused me to wrestle with: Am I really serious about this thing of following Jesus? Um, when things were difficult and painful, yeah, it caused me to throw myself into him of, God, I needed to help. Um, and so I think actually it's just, yeah, done a lot to help deepen my faith in a really positive way. Thanks so much for sharing some of your stories, guys. It's such helpful wisdom for us to hear and learn from. And actually, if you're listening and want to hear more stories like this, we have a whole section on the website, which is stories of various different people, all of whom are same-sex attracted and who are faithfully following Jesus. And their stories are there in videos, short little videos you can go and watch anytime. Hello, Anne here with the exciting news that the Living Out team are going on tour. Um, So if you enjoy this podcast and you've always thought, hmm, I'd love to see what those guys actually look like, now is your chance. The Living Out team will be heading to the northeast of England, um, to Central Gateshead, um, on Thursday the 14th of October. And we're going to be delivering a day's training, uh, which is all about helping same-sex attracted people to stay faithful to biblical teaching on sexual ethics and flourish at the same time. So if you're somebody in a church and you'd like your church to be more biblically inclusive, to be able to support people who struggle with their sexuality, um, then this is perfect for you. So that's Thursday the 14th of October. If you want to book tickets, that's live on our website now, which is livingout.org slash events. So we've talked a bit about our own experiences of following Jesus as Christians who are same-sex attracted and how we found that doable, even in the midst of some difficulties, but also actually some real blessings in that. What about, guys, what advice would we give to other people? Maybe what advice to start with would we give to churches and to Christians who want to help same-sex attracted Christians to thrive in following Jesus? Oh my goodness, where do I start? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think there's lots of things. I think picking up on, on something you said, Andrew, um, early on in this podcast about that community, that sharing with one another, doing kind of authentic real life together. I think that's massive um, because I think we need to have healthy ways of experiencing intimacy. None of us can survive and thrive uh, without that you know, without being known, without being loved and that kind of thing. So church has to be about more than just having meetings for a couple of evenings a week and once on a Sunday. You know, it's got to be family. I think we've got to learn how to do community really well. We've got to learn how to kind of do holidays, do intergenerational friendship, do cross-cultural stuff. Um, 
it's not always easy, is it? Um, and sometimes it's just much easier to check out of the relational difficulties. But I, I don't think that's an option for Christians. I think we, we've got to uh, work out how we how we, we do belong to each other. So we've got to work out how that, that looks in practice. Uh, so I think that's one of, one of the things. Um, I think as well, we've talked a lot about, about singleness and how singleness can be a really good thing. But I think Sometimes churches can make it hard to do, um, particularly when we put marriage up on a pedestal and almost treat treat single Christians as second class. Um, I, I've I, I found that myself quite a lot, and and actually, there's a bit of idolatry of parenthood as well. You're not you're not a real adult, or you you know you haven't fully arrived until you're married with children and that kind of thing. I just think that's really unhelpful. So we need to sort of try and uh, move away from that. Um, and I think the I mean there's lots of other things we could say. I think for me, one one of the biggest difficulties or hurdles I found when I first became a Christian uh, was gender stereotyping. I just, you know, I'm I'm totally not a girly girl. And, you know, I arrived on the Christian scene and there's people like baking muffins and stuff, and I just thought, well, <laughs> you know <laughs> I think, Keish, surely, Keish. Uh, Keish, well, yeah, exactly. I'd never even eaten Keish before. So. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, and I think obviously there is a place for single sex stuff. I think that that could work really well. But I think you know men's events that are all kind of go karting and eating pies, and women's events that are all crocheting and making candles. It's just that's not helpful because you know if you're not a guy who enjoys you know paintballing, and if you're not a girl who enjoys nail painting or whatever, then you can feel like you don't belong and you can feel you can end up questioning your own kind of gender identity as well as your sexuality so yeah i i think let's stick to what the bible says about who we are as men and women um, but not kind of add cultural baggage around all those things um there's lots and lots of other things that we don't have time for in this podcast but i would point people towards the living out church audit which is on our website um which has got a list of 10 statements that you can check yourself against to see how well your church is doing in helping same-sex attracted Christians. So some of these things appear on there along with lots of others. Um, So go to the church leaders section of the website and download the audit. And we also have courses um, that we occasionally take on the road um, to to kind of go through this in more detail and people can ask questions and stuff. And we've got one in um, the northeast of England um, on the 14th of October. So if you're lucky enough to be in that neck of the woods, then do book in on that as well. Brilliant. I think the audit is such a helpful resource, especially for the church leadership teams. And as you might, in my church leadership team, we just kind of become aware we've not engaged with these topics as much as we want to, we would get better in them. And so we've set aside time this coming term that we as a team are going to work through the church audit to kind of, that will highlight for us what are the areas we want to teach into and model or set things up in order to become a more biblically inclusive church. I think it's a really helpful uh, resource. And we're particularly encouraged if you're listening, you're a church leader or uh, in a leadership team in a church context, it's a great thing to pick up and use. Yeah, I, th- I think that's right. I, I think one of the aspects Anne's, Anne's picked up is is so important that we churches can't make marriage ultimate. I, I, I think marriage is good. Obviously, it's something designed by God. But the problem is if you make marriage ultimate, then actually to be same-sex attractive won't feel doable because you're missing out on the ultimate thing. And I think that's partly just churches need to be realistic about marriage. One of the joys of being a pastor is you actually get to find out what marriages are really like. (laughs) And it isn't the sort of panacea for all our difficulties. Um, But also it is possible to flourish without being married. And and churches need to present that it it really isn't marriage or or misery. Um, I think the other way churches can help is is just by giving a, a sort of full-orbed picture of what discipleship looks like. Um, so actually what doesn't help is if there's an image of the Christian life which is always easy, always straightforward, that any kind of difficulty is just to be avoided. I mean, that's not the image Jesus gives. And so actually saying denying some aspects of yourself is just normal Christian life. That helps a lot. You're pointing to eternity, saying all our longings will ultimately be fulfilled supremely on the final wedding day where Christ and the church are married forever. Just holding those images up to me, that makes the Christian life reasonable and doable. Um, 
I suppose we could be nice about Ed since he's not here, but <laughs> but uh, actually Ed's book, The Plausibility Problem, is just really useful, I, I think largely for saying, if you get your picture of discipleship right, you know, if you have the Bible's approach to the whole of life, then in that context, living as somebody same-sex attracted without a, same, a, a sexual relationship, that is doable if it's just part of normal discipleship. What would you say to um, married church leaders who think, yes, I want my church to be a a better context for which singles to thrive, but don't know how to do that? I think that's often something um, I come across, especially. So what would be a few bits of wisdom you give specifically to church leaders in that context? I think partly it impacts how you teach. So, you know, as you're making application in sermons and so on, include single people you know sometimes when you're talking about suffering you you do want to acknowledge some of the pains of singleness but actually also when you're talking about opportunities I actually say things like you know for those of you who are single there may be pains in that but but actually also opportunities for this devotion to to the Lord Um, and partly just trying to create an expectation for families to have more open homes. So again, if you're talking to families saying, how can you serve within the church? Actually, by being hospitable is a massive way you can serve in the church rather than, I don't know, just joining a rotor. So I I think those would be two ways. That is good, yeah. I like to encourage church leaders as well to teach this stuff, but also do this stuff. So actually, if you want your church to be a place where singles get genuinely invited into and involved in families and become part of families, I think ideally you need to be trying to do it yourself, actually modelling it. If if actually you're a church leader and your nuclear family is your castle and no one else comes in, but you stand up on a Sunday telling everyone we need to be experiencing family together, it doesn't really kind of work. Mm. I think actually it's brilliant to practice. Another encouragement I give is just to talk to singles. The reality is some church leaders have been married for so long. (laughs) And if you're in a town like mine, which is mostly young families or retired older couples, there's not a lot of adult singles, to demographic-wise, kind of actually. So, so they don't they don't remember what it's like. They don't interact with a lot of adult singles. So, actually, be really deliberate about befriending and getting to know, and you know, thinking your way into what life experience is like for an adult single in your context, because that's going to better equip you to to serve them well. And also, I mean, I suppose taking that thought a bit further, like have if you can, have single adults in the highest areas of leadership. I, I suppose sometimes I, I sort of, I don't want people to, you know, imagine what life's like for me. I want to be the person doing the teaching and, you know, all that kind of thing. I, I suppose particularly for a single woman, often we don't get as many leadership um, opportunities as men. And the the way into having any influence in a church as a woman is to be married to a man who's in leadership, you know. So, you know, instead of that, you know, I would challenge churches to... Um, Yes, involve people at all levels of leading and serving and, yeah, listen to everybody's voices. Yeah, that's, I guess, so important. And then if we thought about kind of what churches and church members can do, what about what can same-sex attractive Christians do to help ourselves, in a sense, to thrive um, and flourish? In fact, I'll start here because one's just kind of come to mind for me. I, I am always conscious, I think it's so important that we as churches are teaching the reality of church family it's who we are but it needs to be how we live as well and, and laying down that challenge but I also also think as a single I'd want to be a kind of active contributor to that not just a consumer mm-hmm. and I think I have found it very easy as an adult single to sit around thinking why aren't the families looking after me surely they should be <laughs> doing all this stuff and making sure I'm okay <laughs> and making sure I'm doing family love and, and they do have the responsibility but I also have the responsibility to be family for them and to love them and and you know remembering my married friends need friends actually as much as I do. Friendships outside of the marriage are really important true too. And so actually I think just the challenge, yeah, I've received to myself and make to myself is actually how do I make my play my part in making sure that my church community is a place where both singles and married actually can really thrive. I think that's really helpful because I, I, I think that the potential danger is that we kind of drift into a self pity. So I kind of, you know, this is hard, this is miserable, people aren't looking after me to the extent that they should, and maybe God doesn't care about me as much as he should. Uh, And so we want to fight against self-pity. I I, I go back to that phrase you mentioned, Andrew, from 1 Corinthians 7, that undivided devotion to the Lord. How do we get proactive about loving the Lord, serving the Lord? 
realizing he's worth it. I mean, I think it, it is just that sense of as you realize the sheer greatness of Jesus running hard after him, that that's what makes the difference. I remember it's sort of conversation probably about 20 years ago talking to a, a friend of mine and we were both sort of slightly struggling in the Christian life. Uh, and my friend saying, well, we know the answer to this, Andy, don't we? To which I said, well, no idea. But but I remember the <laughs> phrase he used. He said, the answer is this, we go hard after Christ. You run hard after Jesus. Uh, that's one of those conversations I still remember from 20 years ago. Run hard after Jesus and his love for us and his just sheer beauty and greatness. That is so good. And so important, I think, you know, as I said, just making, making that, pursuing Christ, the most important thing in our lives. And there is a risk, I guess, particularly our cultural context, there's a risk that for those of us who seem to be attracted, it can become a huge thing in our lives, the biggest thing in our lives, because we're constantly told this is who we are and it is the most important thing about us and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And actually, I've just found realising, yeah, it's a part, but only a part, and not even a huge one, to be honest, of my life experience is really helpful and realising that it's just not the key thing about me. And so it probably, in a way, it does impact me every day, but not in profound ways. And, and it features in my friendships. I think we talk about it because they love me and want to support me. But actually, also, it's not a key factor in my friendships uh, at all. And just keeping things in perspective is really helpful. If it gets too big, it becomes, well, it becomes unhelpful, really. Yeah, that kind of ties into what my top tip would be for somebody who's maybe younger or... Um just become a Christian and is really questioning whether they can keep going and whether this is doable at all. I think it is talk to somebody who's further along the path, talk to somebody who has, you know, pursued Jesus and has has got to the point of realising actually this isn't my sexuality isn't the be all and end all. Um, what Jesus offers is so much better. It is doable. You know, I, I think that's that's the single thing that's helped me most is seeing people who are further along, who've been there and done it and can show me that it's worth persevering. I think the one thing I'd say to somebody who really is asking this question, you know, is it doable? I'm just on the edge of giving up. Part of me would say think eternity. Don't just think the next week. You know, the reason ultimately this makes sense is because there's a wedding day to look forward to, is because there'll come a point when Jesus will wipe every tear from our eyes. You know, the Apostle Paul talks about not fixing our eyes on that which is seen, but on that which is unseen. And so occasionally I just like to imagine myself sort of 10,000 years into eternity thinking, boy, it's worth living through whatever is hard now. And so part of me would just want to say to the, the person on the edge of giving up, think eternity, don't just think the next week, even the next year. I think one final thing I'd want to bring up, I think sometimes one of the things that might lead someone to a position of thinking, I can't do this, is just the, what can be a real battle with sexual temptation and sexual sin. And probably many of us have said actually our own battle with sexual temptation of being some of the hardest times and the times when you do think, is this doable? Is this kind of manageable? I, think, I just want to, you know, we always want to bring the gospel so clearly. I want to say to someone who's at that point of thinking, I keep on doing whatever it is, X, Y, Z, that I don't want to do, but I seem unable not to do it. Clearly, I can't thrive and follow Jesus in this way. And the gospel is the answer. And just actually the wonderful truth of the total and utter forgiveness and total and utter freedom from shame that kind of sticks to us as we do those things that Jesus offers. But also the gospel goes beyond just kind of giving us a clean state, but then gives us the promise of empowerment to be different, that we are no longer slaves to sin. We're now slaves to righteousness. The spirit of God is living in us, changing us and transforming us. And that doesn't mean something that doesn't feel like a right battle. It's a slogan. It doesn't mean we don't make mistakes on that journey, but there really is hope. So I think my encouragement to someone who might be thinking, I can't do this because of my battle with sexual sin, would be to, to keep going to remind yourself of the gospel and to talk to a trusted Christian friend who can speak the gospel to you. And I'm reminded of a blog which came out a few weeks ago, now kind of the middle of August it would have been, by one of our friends, Dan Reed, called, I think, How Can I Find Freedom from the Weight of Sexual Sin? Which he shares so helpfully and honestly about his own experience, but about the wonderful power of the gospel uh, to, to help us in those times and to help us see, no, even in the midst of a real battle against sexual sin, I can faithfully follow Jesus and can find real life in that. 
So our time is up for today, but if you'd like to explore this question further, do head to our website, livingout.org, for articles, videos, blogs, and other resources that will help you to do so. My thanks to Anne and to Andy for joining me today, and thanks to you for listening. And don't forget to like and subscribe to make sure you don't miss any episodes of the Living Out podcast, and we'll look forward to being with you again soon.